Well, good morning and welcome to the Gathering Church. My name is John Mark Redwine. I'm the lead pastor, and it's so good to be here with you guys today. I've been out the last couple of weeks because my family and I welcomed our third daughter into the world. Yes. Girls, 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 all the time. Always dreamed that I'd live in a house surrounded by girls, and here I am. That was a weird joke. <laughs> My daughter's name is Elvira Maeve. Elvira, you got to say it with a southern drawl or you're not pronouncing it right. Elvira. Everybody say Elvira. Elvira. There we go. All right, and, uh, and she's awesome, and I spent the last couple weeks changing diapers and trying to convince a baby that 3 a.m. is sleepy time, not wakey time. And so we are very happy, but we are also very tired and last night, I decided without telling Rael that I wasn't going to help with the baby in the night because I was like, I got to do church the next day. And so I just, I heard the baby, uh, you know, fussing, but I did not, I did not offer a single helping hand at all. And I think I slept much worse last night out of guilt than I did in any of the previous nights. And so Rael, I'm very sorry. And we can talk about it when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> Big thanks to everybody who's reached out with meals and, and all that kind of stuff, man. We're so grateful for this community. You guys have made us feel loved and valued, and it has been great. And a big thank you to Mikey, who stepped in to preach these last couple of weeks. Some powerful messages. Yeah. Mikey found out two weeks ago that he was preaching 12 hours before Sunday morning. Elvira was born at, at 1.41 a.m. two Sundays ago. And so I called Mikey at like 6 p.m. Saturday night and said, hey, you're preaching tomorrow, bud. It's, uh, it's James chapter 2, enjoy. Get after it. And he crushed it. So good job, Mikey, my man, my man. Well, next week, I'm going to finish this series up with a message on James chapter 4 and 5 that I'm excited about, about having an eternal perspective. And, and, uh, and then we'll be starting at the movies, which we are so excited about. I want to tell you about at the movies for a second. At the movies is coming. And uh, at the movies is one of my favorite series because, y'all, I love movies. I go to the movie theater like 50 times a year. I'm not even kidding. I even managed it last year. Theaters were closed. You figure it out. I did it. I did it. I love the movies. I love them so much. Here's why I love this series so much. I believe that this series is one of the best opportunities we have all year round to help people connect with the kingdom of heaven in a way that is difficult, oftentimes for those who aren't familiar with it. For our friends and our family members and our co-workers and our neighbors who don't have relationships with Jesus, or maybe who, who walked away from those relationships long ago, and they're having a hard time uh, understanding the things of God and the principles of God, I, I love the Gospels and and the way that Jesus communicates his message in them. Oftentimes, whenever, anytime you see Jesus talking about the kingdom of heaven in the gospels, he does so through story. He speaks story and parable, and he uses the culture that the people are living in and, and the stories that mean something to them in order to connect them to things that are bigger than they are normally able to understand. He draws a line between the farmer or the shepherd to the things of God, and that is our goal with at the movies is to take the stories of our culture, the things that we, that we connect with, that we love to, to laugh with, to be awed by, to enjoy, and we take these stories and we redeem them for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We connect them to the kingdom of heaven so that we can understand kingdom truths in a way that is plain and simple and available and in the language that we all speak in, which is the language of pop culture. And so I just love it so much. I want to encourage encourage you, church. We have these incredible uh, invite cards. This is a decal. You can put this on your car. We've got those somewhere. Let's see. I've got too many pockets. It's just one set of jeans. Ha! There it is. These incredible invite cards that look like a video cassette tape. Is that amazing or what? Look at that. Who? Is, some of y'all, some of y'all young people in here are like, what is that? Is that some sort of a that's some sort of, on the back you see the case that we all had there with the VHS with your home movies, you know, and it would have, you know, your parents' wedding, but you recorded over it for Rambo First Blood on there, and 
<laughs> we had uh, a bunch of Christmas videos on what my older sister is here today. She's laughing because we had uh, a bunch of Christmas videos on this one cassette, precious videos, videos with family members who are long gone, who we'd love to revisit, but our baby sister, Jessica, one day, when she was, what, maybe two or three years old, managed to get this video, put it in the VCR, and recorded over it with like six hours of Oprah somehow. And so if you ever want some mid-90s Oprah, I've got a cassette you can borrow. Wish I could revisit those memories of my youth, but thanks to Jesse, we cannot. And so at the movies, take one of these invite cards and hand them out to somebody this week. Hey, partner with us in this. Help us reach people that we don't have access to, that only you have access to, and help us expose some people to the kingdom of heaven, to the gospel of Jesus Christ through a really fun series. We can't wait to get started on it in a couple weeks. We'll wrap up James next week, and then today I want to step back for a moment and look at the second half of James chapter 2, and at a passage that I think really sums up the letter and the message of James in a way that I want us to understand today. It's James chapter 2 verse 17 that I really want to look at and in some translations it reads this way, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. I want to talk about what that means. That's a fun verse, isn't it? Isn't that fun? Faith without works is dead. I, I want to talk about what it means and whether it means we have to earn our way into heaven. Sometimes we can read it, we can perceive that. Does, does this mean that God wants me to earn my ticket to heaven? Does it mean that the love of God depends on the way that I behave? No, that's not what it means. In fact, I love to contrast this verse with a verse that Paul writes in Ephesians. He says this, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourself, but it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. James says, faith without works is dead. Paul says that it is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. To enter into a relationship with Jesus, the only thing that you have to do is believe and ask. It's that simple, exactly as you are. God loves you just as much as you are right now as he would if you were perfect, he loves you right where you are. He, he loves you despite the conversation that you had this week that didn't honor him. He loves you despite the things that you've buried in your past and you hope nobody ever finds out about. He loves you despite the way you got your priorities all mixed around. He loves you no matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, who you know. He doesn't draw a line. He just loves you. And he made a way for you to have a relationship with him that doesn't rely on your virtue. Thank goodness. Read the next verse, verse 10. It says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You see, these things, no matter how the verse puts it, James is very blunt. Faith without works is dead, so get it together, folks. Paul is a little bit gentler. Paul says, listen, you don't get to brag about earning your way into heaven. You haven't. It's a free gift. It's from God. It's by grace you've been saved. However, you are God's masterpiece. You're his handiwork. And he built you and he designed you with this purpose in mind. And that purpose is to do the good things that he prepared in advance for you to do. When he was putting you together, when he was designing you, when he was putting the fabric of who you would become together, he already saw the many good things that would come out of your life. And so these two passages share the same message. Faith leads to works. And without those works, we have to examine the depth of our faith. Jesus says, you're going to know a tree by its fruit. What we produce with our lives shows what we value the most. If we are living like Jesus, then we should produce fruit like Him. Many of us who are Christians, we believe that to be true. We, we acknowledge that. We nod our heads along with the passages that say it. But despite believing that, and despite believing that we should, so many of us don't actually live this way, don't actually live like Jesus. We don't have the fruit to show for it. Why? Why don't we live like Jesus? I think James lays it out for us in chapter 2. One of the first reasons is that we don't want to be uncomfortable. 
What good is it? This is James 2.14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, but they have no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but then does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? I think about that verse a lot. When you see a need and you just say, hey, I sure hope that need gets met. When you see somebody who has something that you can do something about and you say, man, I sure hope, I sure hope that works out for you. Verse 17, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. When this was written, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, was a common way to be nice to somebody without having to do anything. In our day, we might say, hey, take care of yourself, you know, take care of yourself. Or my favorite, hey, thoughts and prayers. My thoughts and prayers are with you. Looks like a hard thing. Looks like a hard thing going on, but I'm giving you my thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers are great, but when they are not accompanied by any kind of action to indicate our thoughts are there, that our prayers are there, then what good is it? See, I believe the comfort of the age that we live in has been a real detriment to our ability to live out our faith. Don't get me wrong. I love me some comforts, but a warm, soft, comfortable couch has prevented me from serving people quite a few times in my life. The warmth of that blanket, come on somebody, bum bum on my TV when I turn on the Netflix, has prevented me from stepping into somebody's life before. It has held me back from doing anything beyond typing thoughts and prayers into a comment section on Instagram. We can insulate ourselves and our relationships so much that we can go as long as we want to without ever really talking to a stranger or making eye contact with someone who might have a need. We often have to be intentional in the moment that we live in to go and find a need because we've done such a good job of insulating ourselves from others and from the needs of others. And it's pretty hard to convince yourself to be intentional about going out to serve people, to find needs, to meet needs, to show value and care for others when you got plans this Saturday to hang out on the lake. Or this Sunday you were going to sleep in and then TCM had a, a marathon of all seven Rocky movies and you, you really promised yourself you'd be there for it. Or maybe you've been worried that if you ask that person at work why they've been so down, they might just get offended that you even stepped in, or even worse, they might sit down and tell you, and then you would have to listen. Serving somebody else, meeting a need, would mean sacrificing comfort that you've worked very hard for. It would mean doing away with the insulation that you have spent so many years building around yourself. See, I think often we don't live like Jesus, love like Jesus, serve like Jesus, give like Jesus, because it's just so much easier not to. So we, we don't do it because we don't want to be uncomfortable. I think a lot of times we just make excuses, excuses for ourselves and excuses for others. I love this. In verse 18, it says, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. You have faith, I have deeds. People have always been the same. They always have been the same. Uh, in, in today's church world, we would say, you know what, that's just not my gifting. Thanks, pastor. Thanks, friend. I, I'd love to help out, but that, that that's just not my gifting. I can't step into that moment. I can't be there. I'm not really a people person. And so I don't, I don't know how much help I would be. I don't feel called to that. I don't feel called to that, Pastor. You know, I asked God and He didn't specifically open up a cloud and tell me to go. And so I'm going to stay right here. Well, I tithe and I attend, I, I attend regularly at church, but serving isn't really my thing. Being being uncomfortable, all that kind of stuff, I don't know. Saturday morning or a Friday night? Now I give you my Sunday. Let's not get greedy. We justify our inaction and our behavior and the way that we treat people because we make good excuses for it. We say, well, I've always been that way. You know, I, I, I know that I'm a little bit hot-tempered. I know I am, but I've always been that way. My dad was that way. His dad was that way. We're just kind of a hot-tempered people. That's just who we are, you know. you got to watch out because I, I'm a, that's just... 
that's just me, and, and I, I don't have to go make that right. I don't have to, I don't have to do anything there. We make these excuses. We, we decide that who is and who isn't worthy of our help or our attention or our respect. And James' answer to this is basically, prove it. He says, show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. In other words, oh, that's not your gifting. Show me what is. In the meantime, I'll just be serving people the way that Jesus taught me to. It's direct. And it's harsh. But sometimes I need to hear it. I can be guilty of this. I know we're all gifted differently and called to different kinds of work within the church, within the body of Christ. And I'll use that sometimes to get out of a conversation or to get out of a moment of care. But the reality is we are all called to serve and we are all called to love others and we are all called to share the message of Jesus and we're all called to take care of the poor and of widows and orphans. We are all called to this. The instructions and the calling of Jesus are simple. Oftentimes I'll talk to people who are trying to discern the call of God in their lives and I just think it's a lot simpler than we've made it. I think we overcomplicate it and we're waiting for something specific or, or we're waiting for, for something loud and obvious. But the call of God is to serve people and to love them and to do it with everything that you've got, to use the gifts that you've been given to serve and love people well. It's just that simple. We don't have to overcomplicate it. And the best opportunity to serve and love someone well is the opportunity that's right in front of you. It's the person who you have access to. It may not feel like the best fit all the time, and that's okay. It may not be. But the best place for us to step in is the place that we can see. Finally, I think sometimes we just, we just don't act like Jesus and serve and get uncomfortable and produce these works because we misunderstood the message. We misunderstood the message. Verse 19, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. James is it's kind of rough. This isn't, they'll be mad at me, guys. I'm just reading the Bible. The language that we use when we share the gospel really matters. The gospel message is a simple one, but it is also possible and easy and even common to oversimplify it. I think the Christian church did that for a couple generations. Well, I grew up in the, in the sinner's prayer generation. The sinner's prayer generation. Billy Graham made this term popular in the 1950s at the end of his crusades as he would invite people into relationship with Jesus by praying a simple prayer. And Now listen, Billy Graham always explained it in its extent. But we tend to be selective hearers as a people. Everybody's this way. We hear what we want to hear. And at some point, we took this sinner's prayer idea, meaning the, the prayer that we say when we enter into a relationship with Jesus, we confess with our mouths that He is God. We confess our sins. We ask Him into our lives. And at some point, we misconstrued that from, a, from an entrance into relationship to being the end-all, be-all, get-out-of-hell-free card. Our fire insurance. Got to get my fire insurance, but I said my sinner's prayer, so I think I'm good to go. We oversimplify the gospel down to a moment, but it was never meant to be a moment. We do a similar thing to that sinner's prayer right here. We'll do it today. We do it at the end of every service, service uh, but we use a little bit different language for it. And we change the language because like a decades-long game of telephone, the meaning has gotten watered down and confused over years. What began as a prayer of admission and a moment to enter relationship with God became this get out of hell free card that was passively mentioned as all we needed. Becoming a Christian does begin with a, a very simple and brief confession and the confession of sin, the confession of belief, a prayer. But that's the first step. It's like the wedding vows. If all I had to do to stay married forever was say my vows at my wedding, my marriage would be a lot easier. But it's more than that. The wedding moment celebrates the beginning. And from there, it's a journey, and it's intentional, and it takes a whole lot of work to do it right. I am 100% married the day that I say my vows. 
But for my marriage to stay healthy and for it to grow and for me to remain happy and joyful and satisfied in my marriage, it requires a journey every single day after my wedding. And it is the same in our relationship with Jesus. In fact, Jesus refers to the church as the bride of Christ, taking the same allegory into his language. The call of Jesus is to follow him and to go and make disciples. It's a daily thing, not a moment of acceptance. Being a Christian isn't just about believing in God. It's about the journey to know him more and more. It's about finding freedom in him and about discovering our purpose in him and using that purpose to make a difference in the kingdom of heaven. That's the point that James is making. Some of us have misunderstood the assignment. It's not just to believe in God and go to church. It's to get on the journey to really know God. It's by grace that you have been saved, through faith, not of yourself. And when you believe and confess, you're 100% saved and going to heaven. But he's also called you to surrender your life and to follow him and to know him more and more and to live your life the way that he lived it and to be willing to sacrifice your life the way that he sacrificed it and to be willing to lay down what he was willing to lay down. It is not just one moment. It carries on and on and on and on. Believing was never the assignment. Faith is the assignment. Faith in a person, faith to follow, faith that makes us think and behave and want differently. Faith does a few things that are visible in our lives. Faith. Faith leads to heart change. Jesus found me when I didn't deserve redemption and he offered it to me freely. I entered into a relationship with Jesus because I understood that despite who I was and what I had done, he loved me enough to give his life for me. That marked me. That changed me. That revelation changed not just the way that I acted. It changed me from the inside out. It changed my heart. The way that I saw the world, the way that I saw people, the way that I behaved, not just because of a behavioral change, but because of a heart change. I love this story in Luke chapter 19. If you've been to Sunday school, you know this one. It says here in 19 verse 2, a man was there, Jesus is teaching, and it says a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, because, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Zacchaeus, you see, was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he. So he climbed up on this sycamore tree because he wanted to see. I forget the rest of the words. Lauren probably knows them. That's my sister. Um, So Zacchaeus was this wee, wee little man. Anyways, Zacchaeus ran and he climbs this sycamore tree so he can see Jesus. Jesus is coming that way. He's teaching. He's talking. And Zacchaeus wants to see him. So he's up in a tree. Just picture a tiny little guy in a tree. Um, When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Zacchaeus completely changes over the course of an afternoon from being greedy and corrupt and money-driven to being generous and kind and ready to do anything that God, that Jesus asked him to do. That's heart change. His heart, the thing that motivates him, it transformed and changed. And it didn't change because of the rules Jesus explained to him. Zacchaeus had had rules explained to him all of his life. He had grown up around Jewish people. He had been ostracized and hated by them the moment he became a tax collector because he wasn't following the rules the right way. He knew what the rules were. You know the rules, and so do I. That's a Rick Astley quote. Zacchaeus understood what he was supposed to do. What changed Zacchaeus was the moment that Jesus looked at him 
and gave him attention and said, I don't care what you've done. I don't care who you are. I see your sins. I see your mistakes, but I want to come to your house today. I want to have a relationship with you today. I want to be a part of your story today. And being seen in that way, cared for in that way, loved in that way, changed the heart of Zacchaeus. His motivation shifted. His, the, the dreams he had for his life changed. The things that felt important to him were now different. A total heart change that results from understanding the love and compassion and grace of Jesus is transformative from the inside out. It affects everything. The things that you are motivated by, the things that you are motivated to do, what you want in this life, all begins to shift. Faith leads to heart change. And faith and heart change together lead to an increased compassion. They lead to compassion. James 2, 16 says, If one of you says to them, go in peace and keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Because faith leads us to a place of compassion. And compassion moves us to care for others. How can you have faith in a God who is compassionate if you yourself do not show compassion? In fact, the very first thing that God wants you to know about himself is that he is a compassionate and gracious God. How can we be moved by God's compassion and not begin to show it ourselves? 1 John 3.17, John asks a similar question. He says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? If you know that God has given up everything for you, and you see someone with a need that you can meet, how can the love of God actually be in you? Do you understand it? Do you understand what's been done? Do you understand the depth of what you've been given? And if, if you do, how can you go on without pushing that forward to someone else? Our hearts change because of the work that God's done in us, and it makes us more compassionate. I love the words of James in James chapter 2, verse 13, when he says, Mercy triumphs over judgment. Church, today, there, if there's one verse you should memorize from James, In the culture we live in, in these divisive times, in this moment of unrest and uncertainty and and just mercy triumphs over judgment. One time Pharisees were judging Jesus for eating with sinners and he says, go and learn what this means. And he quotes Hosea and he says, I desire mercy over sacrifice. See, God is more concerned with how we respond to the sinner than he is with how we correct the sin. Did you hear that? God is more concerned with how you respond to the offender than he is with how you correct the offense. His heart is compassionate and he desires mercy from us. Mercy meaning care and love and peace onto people who do not always deserve it. His followers are compassionate and kind and caring. Faith makes us that way because it's how God treated us in our sin. It, James's work was written, uh, a lot of scholars believe, first, before any of the Gospels, before anything else, that there was this letter of James being circulated. James was leading the church in Jerusalem, but Jerusalem was a big city, and people were always moving out of Jerusalem like they do in big cities into other places, and they longed to be reminded of the teachings of James. James grew up with Jesus. He had a unique insight. Mikey shared with us a couple weeks ago that James is the younger brother of Jesus. That it, Honestly, if there was ever a great proof for the fact that Jesus really was resurrected, it's the fact that his own brother didn't believe he was the Messiah, and then he was killed, and he came back to life again, and now his brother believes he is the Messiah. What would it take for you to believe your brother is the Messiah, right? He would have to be resurrected from the dead. Come on, somebody. Listen. James saw it, and he was like, well, all right, well, I guess I was wrong. 
And he steps into this position of leadership. It's only been about 10 years or so since Jesus ascended into heaven when he writes this letter. That's not a lot of time. I mean, you you can talk to many, many people who experienced Jesus. It's just 10 years later. You can walk around Capernaum and and Jerusalem and and around the peoples around Galilee and say, do you remember Jesus? And they would say, I do. He was amazing. I remember one time he just looked at me and I felt so full and complete and cared for. From one gaze, I remember one time he saw me and he knew my name. And when I heard him say my name, it was like everything just all of a sudden made sense in my life and I felt whole and I felt complete again and I felt put together again and and I I, I couldn't walk and Jesus just looked at me and he said what do you want me to do for you and and all of a sudden I could walk again I'm just telling you it was amazing you could find these people they were not hidden they were not disappearing it was just a decade later and yet James has to write this letter to remind the church that mercy triumphs over judgment. Christians, it is just our nature. It is the sin that lives in us to go the other way, to get judgy, to, to desire sacrifice, to want people to make it right, to want people to, to do what we want them to do, to live the way we want them to live, to, to create an otherness. I, I'm not going to associate with the other. I'm mad at the other. I don't want to be in the same room. They need to get it figured out because they're not being a good Christian. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James is just saying, do you remember Jesus? Do you remember the way that he cared for us? The way that his compassion changed us? The way that he would invite a man like Zacchaeus into his life? Zacchaeus did not deserve to be in the presence of God, and yet Jesus went into his home and ate with him. This is who Jesus is. The Pharisees never understood it. They were coming. Jesus is at a tax collector's house. This, another, another guy. Maybe Zacchaeus. Could be a different guy. We don't know. He was, he was at a tax collector's house, and there was all these bad people around. And the Pharisees are like, what in the world are you doing? And he just tells them, go and learn what this means. I love that. What a slam. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy over sacrifice. That's who he is. And his compassionate leads us to be different people. It leads us to heart change. It leads us to be compassionate. And our compassion moves us to works. It leads us to works. Compassion leads to works. Faith without works is dead because if you have really experienced Jesus, and you've given your heart to him, he's going to begin to change that heart. And it's going to make you more compassionate. And then your compassion is going to lead you to greater action. James in this chapter really is repeating a principle that Jesus gave us. John 15, 5. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, You will bear much fruit, and apart from me, you can do nothing. If we are in a relationship with Jesus, if his word of truth is the loudest voice of influence in our lives, if we're studying him, following him, learning who he is, learning how to live like him, if we are being constantly reminded of who we were when he first said our name, the way that he found us, the way that he continues to find us, then we'll begin to bear fruit like him. And that fruit is the things that we do to care for others, the acts of kindness, the way that we show people value. Serving God doesn't always mean that you you go and, and serve the homeless. That's important. You should do that. But serving God and the works that James are talking about is also showing people value who don't feel valued. You know, one of the most powerful things you can do as a follower of Christ is to make somebody feel seen. Oh my gosh, we live in a masked world. Do you know how unseen people feel? Do you know how alone they feel? They think that they're just never going to be noticed by someone who cares. Church, that's us. 
That's, that's what it means to have the works and the fruit of Jesus. It means to step in to a moment with somebody where you can make them feel the heart of Jesus in person through you. The fruit is the way that we step out of our comfort zones to serve at the dream center or to help our neighbors. The fruit is the way that we lead our families differently. It's the way that we treat our coworkers differently. I just think that if you follow Jesus, you don't get the luxury of standing in opposition to that difficult coworker. You just have to be the person that shows him care and value no matter what. The fruit is the way that we listen to and care for people by making sure they feel heard when they're constantly feeling ignored. See, what James is trying to remind us is that if you can't see the fruit, if nobody sees Jesus in us, if our hearts and our actions aren't marked by the way that he has changed us and is transforming us, then do we really know him at all? Let your life show the fruit of what is happening inside of you. Let your faith express itself through good works. One last thought from the end of this chapter. Verse 25. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. How you live out your faith today is a lot more important than how you lived out your sin yesterday. How you live out your faith today is a lot more important than how you lived out your sin yesterday. Listen, that's for somebody today. Rahab the prostitute is counted amongst the ancestors of Jesus. She's listed intentionally and on purpose as someone who led us to a moment of redemption. She's counted as righteous even though her life wasn't right, but because she did the right thing. Do you catch that? She was not Rahab the former prostitute but she acted out of compassion and care and took care of the people of God and it was counted as righteousness to her. No matter who you are, he can use you. And if you are his, he will use you. And if he is not using you, then you need to reconnect with him. The good news, this is kind of a harsh chapter, I know that. Don't go home feeling bad today. There's good news. Let me leave you with some. The good news is that it is never too late. He is a God of many chances. He is not the God of second chances. That would not be enough. He is the God of redemption. And you, you could have messed this up on the way to church this morning. And you can go out and it can be all different and changed. You can go out and serve somebody, love somebody, see somebody, help somebody. Do the good work of Jesus and and your faith will come alive again. If you're here today, maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you'd like to, or maybe it's just been a long time since people could tell you had a relationship with Jesus. If you're in either of those places, he is just waiting and ready for you to enter back into relationship with him today. He's ready and waiting to transform you today, to use you today. Here's good news. He never takes the assignment that he's placed on your life away from your life. It is always there. You may not deserve it. You may not deserve the purpose that he's given you. You may not, may not deserve the blessing and the peace and the joy and the satisfaction that he has waiting for you because of that purpose. But it is right there waiting, ready for you, waiting for you right now. You can step into it today. And if that's you, with every head bowed, every eye closed, just say this prayer with me and we'll just, this isn't at the end. This is just, hey, we're gonna step right back into it. 
We're going to change this. We're going we're gonna to follow him in a fresh way. We're going to be known as his children, as his followers. I'm going to leave this place today and bear the fruit of Jesus Christ because I believe that if I am his, I should look like him. I should act like him, talk like him, that I should be able to lead people closer to him because of what he's done for me. Jesus, we worship you today. And we say that we need you today. Forgive me for trying to do it on my own. Forgive me for being too uncomfortable. Forgive me for pushing you aside. Forgive me for for not living like you've changed me and transformed me. Forgive me. Forgive me for all my sins. I need you today. I believe you are good and compassionate and gracious. I believe you died for me on that cross and you're alive again. So I'm asking you to come into my heart today. Change me from the inside out. Create in me a fresh compassion. Create in me a fresh awareness of what you've done for me. All that I am from this moment forward, I am yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.